So it's March 19th, 2011, and I am walking to a UFC octagon to fight Luis Kane. I don't know if you've ever been to a live fight before, but the tension in the air is thick. You can cut that tension with a knife. I'm in the cage, the fight starts. Every fight has this feeling out process. You're making moves, but not big moves yet. Neither person is. You're, you're feeling each other out, trying to get the other person's rhythm and timing. Nobody wants to make that first crucial mistake. I go first. I miss. Boom. I get cracked. I fall down. Luis jumps on top of me. Hammer fists, elbows, punching. And in that moment, I chose to be a quitter. I chose to give up. I chose to not stand up and fight back and have the referee come in and stop the fight to save me. The coward Elliot showed up on that day. It's not the first time he's shown up in my life. Six months later, I'm in a hotel room a couple hours before what would be my last UFC fight and the last fight of my professional career. I'm nervous. I'm real nervous. Crying. Scared to the point where I'm not gonna go to the arena. It's not the fight that I'm scared of. It's this coward that showed up in the last fight. I'm scared he's gonna show up again. I don't know why he showed up in that fight. I got no reason to believe he won't show up in this one. My wife looks at me and says, Elliot, you're here. You've done the work. If you just get in that cage, you're going to get $30,000. So just go in, get hit with the first punch, fall down, and be done. We both knew what this was. This is career suicide. There's no coming back from this. I'd be an embarrassment to myself and the entire martial arts community. But I was so scared. I was so nervous that this became my plan. I walk into that cage, and sure enough, first punch, I get hit. I don't fall down, though. I just stumble backwards a little bit. So fuck it, I thought. Let's fight. After two rounds, the fight was close. My coach sits me down in the corner. He says, this is it, Fire Marshal. Knowing that if I lose this fight, my career is over. What have you got? Can you go out there and give me every ounce of your soul in this last round, Elliot? I went out and I destroyed my opponent in that round. I beat him so badly, he couldn't fight for 11 months, and he had to have two surgeries afterwards. There's no Cinderella story to my fight career, though. Somehow the judges said I lost that fight. So an hour later, there I was again with my wife, crying again. But this time, because my career was over. I looked at her and I said, man, babe, I'm never going to be as good as I am today. This moment, this fight, it ended up being so important in my life. It was the first time that I ever pushed past some anxiety to find some power. Power is such a funny thing. It comes upon us at the strangest times in our life. Little did I know, I was going to have to find mine again, dig even deeper but this time in a much different arena. 
Fighting for me was no hobby. I was on the chase of being a world champion, and that chase began when I was six years old. I was born to an African-American father who grew up during civil rights and a Jewish mother whose parents survived the Holocaust. To my grandparents, they were convinced Hitler would come again. My dad, every single time I left the house, he would say to me, Elliot, you need to watch your back. To them, from their perspectives, how could they not prepare me for the world and the things that actually happened in their life? But for me, a little kid, man, this caused some serious anxieties. The worst was always coming. High school wasn't great, but college got better. I became physically fit. I lost some of that baby fat. I started uh, Brazilian jiu-jitsu. It's a grappling art. So I learned how to fight. This grew my confidence. I made some friends. My ego grew. The fear and anxiety inside of me, no one could see. But I knew it was still there. After winning now all the grappling tournaments you can win and conquering the regional MMA fight scene, I got signed to the UFC. The NFL fighting, the ultimate test of strength and power where two gladiators walk into a cage, one leaves victorious. There's a secret amongst us fighters though. We are all afraid to make that walk to the cage. Some Mask that fear with aggression and bravado. Others, the best, the top 10 in the world, they are able to make the past and the future cease to exist so that they only find and exist in the moment. And their real power and greatest skills shine. After hundreds of fights, I could never consistently make this happen. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. My fear and anxiety would prevent me from shining. What if I lose, I would think? What are other people going to think about me? So there I was on that Saturday night after I lost my last fight. My career over, my identity gone. How was I gonna hide this demon that's inside of me? What was I gonna do? I focused my attention on teaching. And two days after that fight, I looked at the building that we would later move our Brazilian Jiu Jitsu school into. We were gonna blow up the scene in Colorado. So we opened a second, a third, a fourth. Life was pretty good. Successful businesses, two amazing kids, couldn't ask for a better wife. Life got not good real fast, as it often does with anxiety. Four nights in a row, no sleep, up all night, panicking. During this time, I could take two prescription sleeping pills and a milligram of Xanax, and I could stay awake. My mind would race. Oh my God, if I don't sleep, I'm going to go crazy. If I go crazy, my wife's going to leave me. She's going to take the kids. She's going to get a judge to say that I'm crazy. And then, man, I'm not going to be able to see my kids. I'm going to kill myself. This is the thought that went through my head all day, every day, for three months. After my fifth night of no sleep, I realized I needed some help. I called my friend, he's a doctor. He immediately started taking care of me. Like I said, some sleeping pills and Xanax for those really intense moments. But he said to me, Elliot, you've been suffering with this demon of anxiety long enough. We need to take some real steps. 
he prescribed Lexapro for me, an anti-anxiety medication. I still take that today. I got a therapist. I see her every week. But most importantly, I had my family and I had a group of friends. They would have done anything for me. Some nights they would stay up with me all night as I panicked. One night my friend Mike called me. I wasn't doing well. I started to cry. He started to cry. And he said, Elliot, there's a lot of people in this world I would die for, but I would kill someone for you. At that moment, at that point, I thought, man, maybe the way out of this is to just go in, like all the way in. Let people see this demon, this fear, this anxiety that exists inside of me. Don't hide them anymore. So one night after teaching, I called my class in. Not just my class, the whole school. Over 100 people. Don't worry, it was before coronavirus. I told them that I was struggling. That I was going to be okay. But for me, right now, life was really hard. But this is what martial arts teaches us. It teaches us how to deal with the difficult moments so that we can survive. No one is immune to these moments. Not me. Not the guy that you used to see fighting on television. Not the guy that some of you younger fighters are now looking at because I won all of the things that you're now trying to win. This guy, he struggles too. You might be struggling. And that's okay. After about nine months, I began to shake the demon loose. I began to look at my fear and anxiety in the face so that I could start to find some power. Like I said, not the power that you look at me and see. Not this 250-pound guy, strong muscle, fighter, successful businesses. That is not my power. My power is that I can survive. I can survive like my grandparents survived the Holocaust. Like how my dad survives being a black man in America. Like how my parents chose to marry someone of the opposite race and religion during a time when that was greatly frowned upon. Yes, I can fight. I step on the mats Every day. Sometimes someone gets their arm around my neck. And I've learned how to stay calm in that moment so that I give myself a chance to survive. I'm getting older now. I'm 40. I get on the mats with 20-year-olds. They're coming to beat me. I get on the mats with those 20-year-olds and I teach them to be more skillful so that they will beat me. This is what I call the gospel of fire. Stepping into your insecurities and vulnerabilities. Facing your fears and looking at your flaws dead in the eye. Letting other people see them. Knowing that some of them will try to use those flaws against you. But. It won't matter. You will have a higher purpose. You will be able to keep charging. You will need to keep entering the arena. I don't know what your arena looks like. It doesn't have to be my arena. It is not necessary for you to get in a cage and fight another man. It does, however, need to be hard. It needs to be difficult. You will cry sometimes. That arena needs to be putting pressure on you so that you are always searching out the most skillful way so that you can start to find your power. This power of mine that I talk about. 
please don't think that it has made that demon go away. He's still here. He's with me every single day of my life. He's no longer a demon, though. He's my friend. And he points me in the direction that I need to walk. Pablo Picasso once said, the meaning of life is to find your gift. I call that your power. The purpose of life is to give it away. So go find your power, my ninjas, and then go give it to the world. Thank you.